It's now time for our final panel session, Product and Service Innovation. Um, could we have our panelists up on stage, please? And I'll introduce them. Now, um, Florence Eid Oakden, we were going to allow you to show a few slides, but I'm afraid we're not going to have the time because we're going to have to keep this session a little bit uh, shorter than we'd anticipated because we've overrun a little bit. But um, if you'd like to sit um, in the order that we um, have you on the agenda, which is... Um, all right, okay, next but one to the end. And can we have the others up, please? Terry Kane and uh, Muad Makhlouf and Greg Rung. I hope you've all got your mics on. Greg Rung will be at the end. And Terry Kane will be here. And Muad Makhlouf in the middle there. So do we have Greg Rung? Has he been mic'd up? Right, they are here. Good. Terry Kane is the head of the auto, finance, telco, and travel industry sectors for the MENA region in Facebook, based here in the UAE. He's been in this role since May last year. Before joining Facebook, he was head of digital strategy for the Jumeirah Group, which uh, I believe is the owner of this hotel. Um, then we have uh, Muid Makhlouf, Director, Middle East, North Africa, International Finance Corporation, which is part of the World Bank Group, of course. He's based here in the UAE. He's responsible for the IFC's investments and advisory programs in more than 20 countries, uh, supporting economic development across the region uh, through private sector development. And in the 2015 financial year, the IFC invested over $1.3 billion in the region. And then we have Dr. Florence Eid Oakden, CEO and Chief Economist for Arabia Monitor, which is a, a, a strategy uh, and research company based in the UK. But Florence is also a board director for the Arab Banking Corporation International Bank in the UK and Jordan, recently renamed Bank ABC. Uh, and she's also a board director at the Arab Bankers Association of North America. And she used to work for the investment bank JP Morgan, where she was head of Middle East, North Africa research. And at the far end, we have Greg Rung, who is a partner in the financial services practice at Oliver Wyman, and he's also a member of the management team in Tri International Consulting Group, TICG, in Kuwait. TICG is the joint venture management consultancy that was founded by the Kuwait Investment Authority, the Kuwait Fund for Arab Economic Development, and Oliver Wyman. And before his current job, he worked for the IFC, so I imagine he and Moed Makhlouf have crossed paths on more than a few occasions. Now, the format of this session is the same as the cybersecurity one. Um, questions are going to come up on the screen. Uh, you'll answer them using that little gizmo, and then we'll get our panelists to comment on what you've said as, as your answers. And um, then they'll explain a little bit more about what they think of the topic. So can we have those questions up on screen, please, Sari? Here we are. Right. Um, to what extent do you agree or disagree with this following statement, banks need to put more effort into creating genuinely new products and services. And you have the same set of uh, options as before. I don't know if you can all see them from there. It's a bit of a sharp angle. But you can always stand up and have a look. Or we can get the strimmer out. <laughs> Right, strongly agree 50%, agree 32%. Meaningless statistics right at the end. Uh, everyone agrees or strongly agrees. Um, Terry, what do you think of that? What does it tell you? Uh, I don't think it's any, any great surprise. Um, you know, as, as an organization, uh, uh, Facebook, we're, uh, we're, we're based highly on innovation uh, in products and services. Um, it, Every day we have multiple releases of different uh, types of software on the Facebook and Instagram uh, platforms, WhatsApp, Messenger, etc. Um, so we're, we're a company built on innovation, built on dynamics, and built on creating products that are meeting the gaps and the needs of, uh, of the various different uh, groups of people that we see on Facebook. 
Uh, and, and likewise, uh, within the biking industry, uh, there's, there's no surprise there, but I wouldn't be limited to thinking of products and services as in mortgages or loans or, 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 or just purely along that train of thought, but, but what are you delivering in terms of meeting the mobile needs of, uh, of your, your consumers? And um, if mobile is not number one on your agenda for, from predominantly a retail banking perspective, then you've, you're certainly heading in the wrong direction. It is the now, it is the immediate future, and well, it is the long term. F Facebook's obviously very innovative. You're not a bank, but you're pro providing financial services. So what advice would you give to bankers to help them become as innovative yeah. as you are? I, I was listening to, to Derek uh, from Barclays earlier on, and, I was, I was, uh, and the previous speaker, Bruno, as well, and I was highly encouraged by the thinking and the process of, that the banks are going through in terms of the pivot that they have to, that the banks and the industry needs to take. Uh, about five years ago, Facebook took a pivot. About five years ago, Facebook was predominantly a, uh, a desktop platform. Mark Zuckerberg decided that the future is mobile. And from that one day, we took the decision to change to a purely mobile-focused company, a purely mobile-focused organization. And every single conversation that Mark had with every single one of the executives in Facebook had to involve the conversation around mobile from that moment forward. We are a mobile first company. 85% of our business comes from mobile. 85% of people who use Facebook, and that's one billion people every single day, use Facebook on their mobile devices. And that pivot wasn't easy within the organization, but it was a determination from the very top all the way throughout the organization to make mobile our number one key focus and deliver purely for a mobile experience. Okay, thank you, Terry. Mohid, what's your take on those results? Uh, very much I agree. It's uh, clear, especially when you look at it from a uh, MENA focus. Um, IFC uh, clearly is a multinational uh, organization. Uh, we have a commercial agenda and we have a, a development agenda. So from, the, from the pure development agenda that we look at, uh, there is always room for more innovation and uh, product uh, kind of creation because that would create and drive the development of a specific region. Terry mentioned something of mobile banking, and I'm gonna state a few numbers which are very much telling in, in MENA. If you look at MENA as a whole, um, uh, and especially at the adults that are uh, in the banking sector, only about 46% have bank accounts. The highest uh, country in MENA is in Morocco, which is about 38%. If you look at uh, Egypt, is about 14%. But then you look at the mobile penetration in MENA, and you try to link the two. Um, uh, mobile penetration in MENA, and I'll state some numbers for you, in Morocco is about 109%. Um, in Tunisia is 116%. In Jordan is also about 116 and in Egypt about 97%. So you look at the mobile banking itself, and you look at the uh, uh, bank accounts that adults have in MENA, and you see the gap. That's clearly, for me, is an area where you can innovate and drive the product. There is a, a bank that we know very well in, in Kenya, CBA Bank. It was a very small bank in, in Kenya, but when you look at it now, it's because of innovation and focusing on mobile banking, it's the largest bank by asset size. Um, mobile banking is one area. Um, you have uh, an, an, an agenda, again, for us is uh, development. You have women banking, for example, is another development agenda that we try, try to drive forward in, in the MENA region. Um, when you look at MENA and compare it to the rest of the world, um, women that come into the labor force is about half the rest of uh, the globe. Um, and that's clearly a gap. W women in the labor force? Le le women in the labor force. That doesn't mean it's, it's lack of education. You look at the graduates in this part of the world, about 97% of uh, uh, college graduates in Kuwait are women. About 63% in Qatar are women. About 57% in Saudi are women. So women are graduating, but they're not translating into the, uh, into the workforce. But that's, again, an, a, an area and a gap for innovation of uh, women. But 30% of SMEs in, in MENA are women-owned SMEs. So that's another gap where banks um, uh, and financiers can focus on from an innovation and development agenda. Okay, thank you. Florence, your take on this result. Do banks need to spend more time innovating? Absolutely. I mean, I think that where we see instances of uh, success in innovation, as Maya just referred to, is where banks are making a special effort to reach out to women. That's a very fast-growing um, um, customer base, uh, in particular in the area of uh, entrepreneurship uh, finance. 
because uh, that's an area that women can break into uh, without having break th break to break through glass ceilings because they are, in a way, their own bosses from the beginning. So there's a socio-cultural aspect to this that is n not, uh, you know, often not, not underscored sufficiently in, in the creation of these types of products. Default rates are also very low, as we know, starting with the Green Bank experience, but also looking at some of the more recent experiences. But also, another area where banks are um, innovating and uh, taking advantage of, of niche opportunities that are presenting themselves is in Islamic finance, for example. So the city of London made the strategic decision a few years ago uh, to try to become a center of Islamic uh, finance. Um, they issued a, a government uh, sukuk in 2014 that qualifies as a liquidity buffer. This was a major boost to the uh, Islamic finance market. And the banks that were well positioned to take advantage of that have done something with it. For example, the bank whose board I sit on, ABCIB, um, has done quite a lot over the past couple of years in uh, Islamic financial services, in particular in Murabaha, Reverse Murabaha, Ijara, uh, these uh, types of instruments, uh, took advantage of a well-regulated real estate market in London, took advantage of the fact that Middle Eastern investors have always liked London real estate, but have uh, w look to diversify even more as of late since the Arab Spring and, and you know, achieved growth in this domain of you know, 50% 50, 50 per annum um, on average. Um, and so that's an area that I think is very promising. But you're uh, not a fully Islamic bank, are you? It's, it, you've got a subsidiary that's a window in the, in the jargon. Is, is that right? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Your ABC Bank is not a fully Islamic bank. It's a subsidiary that you have yes, that yes. runs the Islamic banking operation, which is which we call in the bank, we call it absolutely, a window, Islamic absolutely. window. No, it's a conventional bank with, a, with an Islamic mm. arm. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I think that you know, the, their, the growth in, in Islamic uh, finance in general in the world has been quite impressive. I mean, the, the, this market only mm. <laughs> uh, tapered a little bit after the financial crisis by achieving 10% growth per annum. <laughs> in between 2009, 11, and 12. And then since then, it's been back up to 15, 16%. Uh, and, and uh, you know, banks that have taken advantage of uh, the benefit of developing Islamic banking products in new markets, such as Western markets, and certainly an important market like London, have done quite well with that. Yeah, it's interesting that Islamic finance has been around for many years, but you're still referring to it as innovative. And um, you have to be innovative to come up with new ways of providing these Islamic products. Yes, I think new market niches yeah. is the key yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, Greg, your views on this? I agree. Uh, banks can definitely do more in the space of innovation. The question is, why, why do you want to innovate? It's not a, an end in itself. It's, it's a means to an end. The end being serving your customers better, growing and generating more uh, bottom line. I think we talk a lot about mobile, but mobile you know, innovation took place before. And, um, and if you put digital, um, digital story aside for a minute, I think one thing that jumps to mind in, in, in the region is that very few banks have value propositions that are truly aligned to segments and, and also moments in life, for instance. Um, Moyed was talking about female entrepreneurs, etc. I, I think a lot of the banks have segmentation which are not very granular in the region and, and if you go and we've done some benchmarking on that to the websites or to the value proposition of the banks, it's, it's, it's very much around set of products, not so much into value proposition that we meet specific needs of a specific population at a specific point of time. Um, the, the other thing that we see in banks is a lot of the traditional recipes on, on how you come up with value propositions and understanding you know, the market, etc. exist, but there are some typical gaps also, for instance, um, understanding the lifetime value of a product. Uh, it's good to innovate, but is it going to make money? And not just next year, but you know, people are going to buy a product, they're going to stick with it for a certain duration, um, sometimes a very long duration. What's the lifetime value? Uh, you don't see this um, in many banks, uh, uh, that kind of approach. Now, if you add the digital uh, side to the story, I, I think uh, you know, Facebook is equipped and has been created on, 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 and other players on, on, on the foundation of, of, of adding new products and, and being a platform. Very few banks are not obviously built around being a platform to partner with non-bank players. They, they, the, the banking model has generally been very integrated and organic. So we manufacture products, we sell these products. Now when it comes to working for, with non-financial institutions, with fintechs, 
A lot of banks in the region have never done it before. It's, it's you know, very uh, rarely done it. So it's, 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 a, it's a tough process to, to learn. It mm. takes a lot of effort, and that's kind of the stage they're in. And clearly, pure players who come from that space have, have, a, have an advantage for, for that particular okay. Great. aspect. Thanks. But, but yeah. to, to, to the point on this, this is probably the greatest challenge that the financial institutions have behind this, this walled fence of uh, technology. It's very difficult to get anything innovative through the steps within the organization. But what ING seem to, to have done, and Barclays seem to have done it, is take that outside of that walled garden and say, build, and when you're ready and when you're successful, take it back into to the organization. It's innovating within the organization, but not within the, the, the confines of the, the processes, which is very interesting. Right, time for another question. Question two, please. There we are. <clears throat> Make sure it coincides with what we've got here. Um, because innovation in banking is high risk, fear of failure is holding back product and service development. So, would you strongly agree all the way through to strongly disagree? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I thought you'd be afraid, but you're not too afraid. Uh, well, 25% strongly agree, uh, they're afraid, and 31% agree, so they're afraid, but there's quite a significant number, 35% disagree with that statement. So let's put Greg on the spot first. We'll go this, do it this way around. Well, what does that yeah. tell you? Uh, I'm not very surprised because it, it boils down to the definition of risk. Uh, I, I think Banks are equipped to deal with a number of you know, trade risk, market risk, et cetera, uh, and, and can handle uh, them in a way. So I, I would understand that part of the story. But I think a lot of the barriers have to do with other types of risk, and I don't know if they fit into the definition you have here. One is obviously the, the cultural silos. I think somehow you referred to that. Uh, we see a lot of cultural silos in, that come in the way of innovation and creating new products. Um, also, the, the IT burden. I mean, introducing new players um, and plugging into a platform. Um, you know, definitely, this is this is very difficult for a number of banks. I'll just take one example. If you know, if you, if you are a new player, for instance, you want to break into the acquiring business. Uh, and in many countries, acquiring is a bit of an oligopoly. If you want to go into that business. Uh, you, you will see that, you know, obviously, in, if you see it from the inside of the bank, you would have the retail team, the SME team, the corporate team who would have very different take on it. Uh, the, the, you know, the retail team would look at the link with the issuing business, the SME would look at it with the point of sales business and, and also the, the impact on credit risk, and the corporate team would look at it more from a cash management point of view. If you run the numbers and talk to the people, they would have different incentives. And typically, we've seen a lot of, 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 of internal politics and fights that would come in the way and ultimately uh, would slow down innovation. Mm -hmm. And add to that the IT aspect, you know, for instance, I go back to acquiring. Acquiring requires linking to point of sale terminals, the maintenance of that, new, tech, new, new equipments that need to be purchased, and linking that to the pipes of your cash management business, et cetera. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank this, you. Is, this is complicated, and, and that, that comes in the way. Um, I, I would just, um, so I think the, the last point I would add is, is launching new products uh, and services is, you know, obviously is risky, but also one has to wonder when it becomes successful. Mm -hmm. When do you pass the hurdle and how do you define success? Okay, sorry uh, to cut yeah. you off there, but, um, but I'll, I'll, that's, that's, yeah, that's go a good ahead. point. We've got a lot of people to get through and we've got another question as well. And then we've got questions from the yeah, audience. Sure. Uh, Florence, um, fear of failure, is that something that you that You know, I... I don't know what the breakdown in the room is between bankers who are from the region and bankers who are not from the region, but this is actually a terrific result. Because I can guarantee you, if you conducted this little survey in London today, you would not get that sort of result. <laughs> because banks are atrophied by, and you know, uh, practically immobilized in the West by their regulators, because regulation has become so onerous that any, any innovation is, is thought through really, really carefully before it takes place. Um, if, in fact, we have a high a breakdown in this audience of bankers from the region, uh, that to me is um, an indication that this region never stops producing good news in the midst of terrible news, mm -hmm. <laughs> headline news. So if, if bankers here feel that innovating is easy still, 
uh, that's fantastic. That's really good news. <laughs> good. Uh, Moyed? Sure. I actually uh, I agree somehow with the, with the result. I think most of it is not uh, uh, fear of failure. Most of it is uh, at least what we see in the region, especially with banks in the region, is lack of uh, uh, opportunities that is um, kind of uh, captured within the banking system. If you see a lot of uh, banks in MENA, and you, think, you take one segment of what they do, um, uh, and, and Greg mentioned SMEs, um, if you look at the balance sheet of most of the banks in MENA, only 8% of the balance sheet goes to SMEs. Not that there's no opportunities in the SMEs, the opportunities is, is there. Not it's a, a fear of failure, but there has been so much to do at the corporate side that I think most of the lending or most of the transaction or products to SMEs have been ignored. But once you show these uh, banks, and a lot of them have actually kind of uh, built this uh, product into them, once you show them that this is actually a business opportunity, a profitable business opportunity, they will go after it. And we've seen this actually develop in some of the markets here in Oman and Saudi, elsewhere as well. So it's not only fear of uh, failure, but it's sometimes uh, a lack of strategic vision. Sometimes when you, when you t tackle uh, the low income, for example, in a certain economy, these low income, if you put it as a strategy, they will become a middle income at some point in time. We've seen this in China. The low income have become a consumer uh, space in, in, in China. And, and as uh, some of the banks who actually built the product to tackle and to work with the low income uh, consumers uh, are probably benefiting a lot from now. So it's a vision, it's a strategy into what you want to do or where you want to be in the market. Mm, okay, and Facebook, they don't know what failure means. It's not in your dictionary, is it? Uh, failure <laughs> or fear, we, we've certainly experienced and learned from failure. Um, do you know, I, I've been in, in the region here for 10 years now, and I don't think there's anywhere else in the world that, that, that understands what vision and, and opportunity uh, is quite like the UAE and, and quite like Dubai. And, and fear doesn't seem to be a, a word on the dictionary for, for the region. Um, particularly within the Facebook world, look, we, we, we try, we feel, we improve, we, we elaborate. We're, as, uh, I guess, as, uh, as uh, flexible as it comes on, uh, when it comes to the products and development. I think specifically within this region, I think one of the areas that we need to get over the fear of is the entrepreneurs, it's the startup, it's facilitating that journey, facilitating the digital journey for entrepreneurs and startup. You try to get an online, bank, uh, 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 an online payment gateway in this region is a major barrier to actual uh, e-commerce business. Um, so that, that, that fear of, of technology, um, I still think, uh, or that, 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 that barrier to uh, entrepreneurs and startups getting over the low cost or getting into a low cost uh, digital world is still an area that needs to be resolved here. Okay, thank you. Right, uh, third question, uh, controller over there. Oh, it's already up. Right. Um, Non-financial institutions like Facebook, Google, and Apple will continue to take market share from banks. What do you think of that? Do you agree, disagree? I feel like no matter what ways this goes, I'm going to be representing uh, Google and uh, Apple yeah, as well. I'll, I'll, I'll be asking you to comment yeah, first. Straightforward. Um, okay, well look, it's 41% strongly agree, 36% agree, as a small amount, 15% disagree. So there are some optimistic bankers out there, um, but most of you um, agree and you seem to accept that um, you're going to lose more market share to the likes of Terry. Um, what do you think? I feel like the villain in the room amongst <laughs> bankers. <laughs> Uh, I, I think that there, that there is an inevitability that uh, when, whenever you build a platform that has one billion people on the platform, on their mobile devices, every single day, upwards of 40 minutes every single day, they're, gonna, they're going to want to do more than simply view videos and communicate. This is becoming their platform of utility. If you look at Asia, it's already become the platform of utility, and, and, and certainly in China, where you book and you pay for almost every part of your daily life. There is absolutely no doubt that this is the direction that Facebook are going in terms of making Facebook, Instagram, Messenger as platforms, not just for communication, but as a utility. We opened peer-to-peer -peer payments in March in the USA last year. It's been a great success for us. That will roll out uh, throughout the rest of uh, next year as well. Um, but I also have to, I have to absolutely say that uh, there's, there's not really one financial institution that I can think of globally that I would consider utilizing all of the Facebook, Instagram, Messenger APIs, marketing tools, strategic tools to deliver you higher return on investment, 
on your marketing activity. There's not one bank that I can think of today that's absolutely utilizing all of those opportunities. Okay. And it's there. Your, your view, and if you can think of a bank that does utilize all those sure. opportunities, tell I'm, us. Not, I'm, I'm just going to say, I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer. I don't have a Facebook account, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm one of the few people who don't have it. But um, uh, So I'll comment on one thing, on one segment. Uh, what we call NBFIs, non-bank financial institutions, that actually banks don't target and have a, uh, a, an angle into a market that most of the bank miss, which is uh, uh, crowdfunding or microfinance. Um, a lot of it is run now by uh, uh, web pages and through uh, technology-based uh, platforms that uh, tiger market segment that's actually uh, uh, banking sector is not looking at for a variety of reasons. It's difficult, it's, uh, it's time-consuming, etc. But these uh, uh, technology-driven platforms are targeting this, uh, this uh, market segment and doing it very successfully in, in, in several markets. I'm not mm -hmm. sure is, if Google or Facebook doing this, but that's a market segment that's actually taking a lot from the banking sector. Yeah. Okay. Florence? I, th I think it's, it's hard to disagree with the statement, the overwhelming <laughs> positive response responses, testament to the inev inevitability of what's happening. I wonder you know, whether people aren't worried here if the minority are bankers um, by this sort of reply. But I also wonder whether this isn't a pendulum swing. I mean, I remember when, um, um, uh, you know, when people um, were uh, putting uh, business plans uh, you know, up for IPOs back in the early 2000s, and valuations went off the charts and then the Nasdaq collapsed. This might not be similar, it might be a smoother uh, introduction of technology into services than what we witnessed in the early 2000s. However, I, I wonder whether this isn't a bit of a pendulum swing. There is um, a logic to banks and there's a reason why they have um, been invented and have existed through centuries. So, uh, so any, any solace to the bankers here, traditional bankers among you? <laughs> Okay, Greg? Yeah, I, I would be more assertive. We believe there is a true shift. Uh, true that the, 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 you know, in online players have been in existence since the, in the uh, yeah. early 2000s. But as described earlier by the uh, presenter from ING, and as you mentioned, um, based on the Facebook experience, there is a true shift with the new quality of technology as well as with the new amount of usage. Um, it's not just these players who we see as competing banks, uh, insurers, uh, big, big contenders in our view, um, South Africa for instance, two leading insurers are launching two new banks. Uh, it's not a big market, mm -hmm. but two new banks launched by insurers. Telcos, uh, Orange for instance has launched banks in Poland, France, Spain, Italy in one year. And even in Poland they launched after a few months they were already in some categories of banking, they were already number two or three in the market in a few months. Mm -hmm. So that gives a sense that there are two things that are changing for good. I think the implication for banks is uh, to reconsider the fact, as I mentioned earlier, that you don't have to be an integrated player and, and own everything in the chain. Uh, consider yourself much more as a modular player where you may partner in some areas uh, with players who have better access to clients, better access to devices, but you have a role to play, that's for sure. You have reasons, uh, it is a reason why you exist, but it's, it's a shift in terms of uh, how you think it has direct implications on, you mentioned APIs, on how you use all the tools and how you build your platform to accommodate for, for these partnerships. Okay, thanks, Greg. Now, we've only got about three minutes left before we move on to the final presentation. Does anybody have any questions before I get the panelists to sum up? Put your hand up if you have a question on product and service innovation for any of our esteemed panelists. No? Well, that should make it fairly easy to wrap up because what I'd like you to do, and I'll start with uh, Terry again, if you could just, if, if there's one thing that you'd want the people in this room to take away from what's been said on the panel today, in particular what you've said, what would it be? Uh, the one thing that, that, that I that will keep coming back to at Facebook is, is the personalization of your services. And the, there, there's nothing more personal to every single individual um, than their mobile phones, than their mobile devices. And if, if you look around the room today, five years ago, the, every table would have had two or three laptops on them. Today, there's not a single laptop on any single table. Um, because the number one place that you're doing all of your communication, that you're doing all of your business effectively is now on a mobile device. Um, personalize your experience through the best in class. 
innovate by sectioning off parts of your organization to focus on your, on your key challenges that your, your consumer has and, 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 and be better people for your consumers. And that's, that's a win-win, I that's think, okay. for everyone. Yeah, per personalization. Facebook, it's in the name, isn't it? Face, person. It's, uh, it's a very <laughs> good point. Muyed. Absolutely. I, I, uh, I definitely think, and as I said at the, at the outset, uh, at the start, uh, innovation is a main driver of development. And that's one of the things that we drive for. There are gaps in the market. There are gaps that allow some, for some of these innovations, be it in the banking sector, be it in technology, et cetera. Um, uh, Terry mentioned at the beginning of the discussion, uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, this is something that we would like to drive forward in, in MENA. And we see some of the accelerators that have come up. And this is something I think is very useful for, for the whole agenda agenda of uh, job creation, of youth unemployment, etc. It, it doesn't, it's not cost uh, uh, heavy, so we, one can easily become an uh, inventor or entrepreneur with very simple product or very simple kind of uh, means. Um, and it links into the gaps that are uh, present in the market, like we said, from a banking perspective, product was be it Islamic or SME or woman in banking. So for, for the banks, at least if we're talking to the banks within the region, there are, there are gaps. And for these banks, as they innovate to tackle these gaps and create more profitability and more return for their shareholders. Okay, Florence, the one thing you'd like to stress? I'm quite encouraged by the optimism to, you know, reflected in the second reply on the capacity to innovate in, uh, in this market. And I would, uh, I'm not surprised that you know, a, a forum like this being hosted in Dubai results in that sort of reply. In Europe, you'd get a much more dour reply today. And I would um, urge the, the powers that be, be it the Association of Banks or the government, to leverage that, to leverage this moment of optimism, because we've had them come and go, including mm. in Dubai. Uh, I remember when, you know, five years ago, things were different. The outlook was different. So to leverage this optimism in order to propel forward innovation in, in banking in, in this part of the world, with perhaps the UAE market in the lead, why not? Mm. So be optimistic. Greg. Yeah, I think um, there are a number of things that can be done immediately. Uh, innovation uh, existed 20, 30, 40 years ago. It doesn't, you know, it's not new. Um, but innovation, um, you know, can, can happen without IT changes. You can refine your value propositions. You can align them to moments of life and segments. That's one thing that can be done across many organizations in the region. The second thing is when it comes to IT and digital, a, a lot of organizations don't, um, don't know how stressed the business model is when new players come in um, because they, a number of us don't know what we don't know. So when an API comes in and you never as a bank use an API and work with uh, people who can plug into the API, you don't quite see what is, what is gonna happen. And you need people from the IT industry, from the internet industry to come and stress test your, your gaps because they can be quite alarming in some institutions. Right, so stre stress test your technology with a, possibly an external partner. Well, look, gentlemen and lady, uh, thank you very much for your participation. Well done. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.